I asked my Discord what song they wanted me to remake next, and by far the winner of that was Touching Yourself by The Japanese House. So in a couple hours, I was able to make this. I want to show you guys how I did it. But before we jump into that, let me just quickly plug my own studio real quick. The reason I'm able to make these videos is because I work as a freelance music producer. I take people's song ideas and turn them into tracks that are in these styles. So if you enjoy the kind of music that I feature on my channel and you think we'd have fun working on a project together, check out the top link in my description. We can jump on a call and chat and see if we can get a project going. Okay, we have a lot of layers going. I think we'll start out with the bass. So one thing to note about the verses is that it's three bars followed by four bars. So if you count it out, it's one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one. So if you've ever had problems counting the verses, that's why. But yeah, we have this bass that's sort of hitting our main notes. We're in the key of E flat major with some noodling in the higher arpeggios. With this kind of bass line, I think it's best to get your low chords that you know you want to hit and then add your syncopated notes and riffs in between that. So originally it just kind of sounded like this. And then we add these little guys in between just to help you walk between those notes. I'm just using a Reckenbacker bass inside of Moto Bass 2. I feel like when you're picking a bass, the three things you wanna look for in terms of frequencies are the sub low end, your sort of lower mid range slash higher range of low end, and then your brightness. So if we take something like a P bass here, it's a little bit beefier in the mid range. If we did something like a jazz bass, there's a little bit more of a scooped mid-range. If we did something like an active bass, we have a lot more of a crystal high end, not as many dips. Also, the low end reaches a lot lower. And just after listening to all of them, I just felt like the Rickenbacker was just kind of like the best choice. Nothing crazy on the mix channel strip. Basically, whenever I'm using virtual mix rack on something, I'll switch things out, but it pretty much follows the same pattern of preamp, EQ, compressor, and then maybe a little bit of spice on the end. So I drove a Neve channel strip a little bit just to bring out a little bit of odd harmonics. I passed it a little bit to keep it from interfering with the kick and then uh, scooped out a little bit of 350 because I thought that, that was kind of annoying. Also tamed some of the high end. Um, I used an optical compressor because the bass line is very movement based. It's like boom, boo, doo, doo, dee, boom, boo, dee, boom. Stuff that's like more melodic like that. I prefer optical compression, just a little bit of thickness. And uh, yeah, it's a pretty simple bass patch. We can then look at our guitars, which all together sound like this. <laughs> So the first thing we have are these plucks at the beginning. So we just have this guy here, which is a strat doubling up the bass line. It just kind of makes the notes pop out a little bit more, like here when we layer the two together. Then I turn off the guitar. Like the notes just pop out a little bit more. For these guys, I used guitar rig. I just used this Prince in the Rain preset with the ensemble and the studio verb turned off. It's basically just a compressor and a jazz chorus amp. A little bit of EQ, a little bit of limiting. We then go into this guy here. Which is the exact same thing, just played up really high on the neck. I was just sort of following the rhythm of the main bass line and playing my hits on the same timing, but I'm not really following exactly what the bass line is playing. It's just this sort of strange melodic phrasing that sort of has its own thing going on. Like here, this guy is going up, this guy is going down just gets this sort of like cool movement thing going. The next two guitars that we have are these guys.
for this, I put the capo on the third fret and I just played some shapes in C, sort of focusing on the higher strings. Try to get a little bit of a slappiness out of it. I uh, used the same patch, but to actually turned on the ensemble chorus. I should also mention a lot of the flavor of this song are with the reverbs that I'm using. So I'm using a really short plate, like 0.2 seconds. And then I'm using ROM reverb, but I actually changed the preset to this big room sound. Again, with a shorter decay, but this one's like 0.8 seconds so it's like the longer of the two so here's the flavor of the vintage verb and then here's the flavor of the rom just throwing a lot of elements from the band into this. And then later near the end of the song, there's this solo that comes in that's just kind of like the bridge melody. which is just like a crazy drivey sound that I had. I'm just using this random patch that I have, which is like a Saldano and an AC30, which is just like really bright, high voiced amps with a little bit of distortion. I just wanted it to be like stupid drivey. I'd say one of the main characteristics of this track is there's a lot of like legato melodies sort of swimming around each other. Like you have the bass line that's just this arpeggio thing. You have this separate pluck that's kind of doing its own thing. You have this melody in the solo and and there's a couple of other synth elements down here that are doing their own thing, which I think if you're going to do a song like this, you need to make sure you're simplifying what you're playing melodically so that each element is like having its own room to play, especially since most of them are playing the same syncopation, like da, 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 da. like there's this eighth note pulse that everything is kind of playing. So it's really important to make sure things are in separate ranges or registers. They're going in different directions, like in terms of like the melodic phrasing have like low note, low note, high note, low note for one of the parts and then like have high note, lower note, lower note, lower note for the next one. Like have the actual shape of the phrasing be slightly different part to part. That's how you can get like these movements that sort of like cascade in and out of each other. Cause it is really easy to have something like this just turn into mush. And then we have our drums. Just picked out some stuff from Steven Slade drums that I thought fit. Um, I'll normally go through and find a kit that overall has the vibe that I want. And then when I'm getting a little bit pickier, I'll go through and like find like individual hats, which sounds like this. The, the hi-hat on the record is very like short and staccato. It almost sounds like a Lin drum machine. This was a very difficult drum sound to emulate because it's very much like a live kit sound. And so you want to bring up the sort of pop characteristics of a drum kit that make it like stand out in a mix, but you don't want it to sound like artificial. So for the kick, I was using this like Ludwig 24 inch hard. And then for the snare, I had this sort of deeper pearl got kind of a bit of a ring to it, but in the actual track, I had the velocity of it pretty low so that the ring didn't come out as much because it, it, it's like sort of like a softer backbeat type song. And then for both of these tracks, I actually did a little bit of like sample reinforcement. So I just copied the MIDI from the slate drums and then brought them onto drum racks that have like their own samples. Here we have a snare, which is this Leno sample here and then for the kick i have this leno tape copeland kick and they're just like subtly underneath the kit so here if i turn the samples off now if i turn them on they just add a little bit of beef behind everything it's a very basic backbeat, nothing really complicated. I feel like the second you get into like a moving bass line, that's like pretty complicated and going all over the place, you're getting into the realm of something that needs like a simple drum beat. So I made the beat with like this kit and then I stemmed it out in Ableton. So you go into Steven Slate drums, you go to mix and then here at the bottom, you can see where it's like stereo one, two or three. So you're choosing a separate output for those instruments. So I just have everything that's normally on the kit on a one, which is just like the default. And then I set separate outputs for the kick and the snare. And then you can just create a separate audio track that's blank in Ableton, set it to in, and then select that multi out from the dropdown. So the regular kick, if I turn all the processing off, sounds like this. The chain. So I'm just doing basic EQ through on this Pultec style EQ. Um, shout out to Kive Audio. I've done some stuff with them for promotional stuff and they gave me a, a download code to some of their plugins and uh, they have some really cool stuff. Uh, this Pultec EQ is really nice and handy to throw on stuff. So here without the EQ. 
Then with it, just cutting out some of the mud, boosting some of the highs. With the Poltec, I'm just kind of like boosting ranges that I feel like need it and then adding a little bit of a cut to ease into it a bit. Without, just kind of feels dead without it. Also doing a bit of transient shaping. Just using the sustain mainly to make it a little bit punchier by shortening it. The complex compressor, just getting it a little bit more in your face and spitty. Moti T, I kind of just use this as like a general like sound goodizer. On the snare, here's what it sounds like without the mixing chain on. So I threw it into a Neve preamp, peaking it a little bit because I know I like my snares to do that. Boosting some of the lower frequencies, cutting some of like the 600 mud. Threw around EQ to get rid of those like resonant frequencies in the snare. So if I solo them. And, and then a little bit of Moti T on this drum designer. Just makes everything a little bit nicer. Uh, threw this clap sample in on like that last hit, the end of the progression. So it'll like. It's almost like Michael Jackson y. On the overheads, they sound like this. Something similar, just sort of a Neve preamp, EQ, going into Hive Compressor, the little bit of drum designer. I just, I like this preset because um, when you boost it up to 100, you can hear it. It's kind of like evening things out, especially in like the weird honky mid range. And then I just bring it back to like 11. We then have percussion, which all of them sound like this. And it looks like all of these are from the Oliver percussion pack, except for this uh, Frank Moody one. Just trying to get some stuff that has like a little bit of spit to it, a little bit of like a head boppy rhythm. So this top one here, really tight. Then this one below that, basic tambourine. And then below that, Just a little bit of 808 hi-hat stuff going on. And this guy. Weird little castanet thing. And then on my drum bus, again, using a little bit of that Kive Pultec EQ, Neve preamp slash EQ, a little bit of FET compression. Just to tie everything together. I've really been obsessed with a G clip recently. It's been a really fun like clipper to just get things tight. And uh, for people who don't understand why you would use something like a clipper here, if I take a meter here and I just turn off the clipper, we're gonna look at like the peak volume here. So this drum beat is peaking at like negative six and a half. If I turn that clipper on, It sounds exactly the same volume wise, but now we're peaking at about negative 8.2. And uh, when you get to things like mastering, stuff like that really helps. You can keep transients from poking out too much. You can't go crazy with it because otherwise you'll just destroy all the transients of your drums. But uh, it can be a good way of sort of just giving yourself a little bit of headroom on the end. And then also the percussion is like side chain to the kick and the snare. just to give them a little bit of space. And then we have our synthesizers. So we have two main parts. We have this guy down here, which is just a preset that I found in Anna too called Theremin for Grievous. I turn off the chain. It's just this sort of like warbly thing that goes through the chorus. It's interesting. It's like you're adding a little bit of movement to it, but it's like such a round sound that it can almost like disappear underneath the main vocal. And then we have the lead sound that's probably the most popular. So I got this from layering a bunch of synths together. So we have this whistly tone, which is a Arturia OPX patch. Smooth tone to it, but also it's like a little bit warbly and dinky. We then got that layered an octave up. Then to give it a little bit of girth, we have this guy, which is a CZ patch. Just this like super obnoxious envelope-y sound, but it like ties the two of these together. So when you add them all, 
they just kind of blend really well. If we blend the two synths together, you'll hear what I'm talking about of like them like cascading around each other. Like they just kind of like fade in and out around each other and it's just, it's really cool and I love it a lot. And then you throw all of that into a limiter and it sounds something like this. So yeah, that's the track. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this. If you like content like this, or if you're somebody who's learning how to produce music by yourself, uh, check out the Discord. I'm giving out a lot of free stuff in there now. And the reason that tracks like this are getting recreated on this channel is because that's what they voted for in the Discord. So uh, if you wanna have a say in what I reproduce in the future, that's the best way to do it. I'm also releasing a song every Friday. So I'm sharing my insights in that group. Also giving away things like free mastering presets or my mix checklist. So if any of that seems cool to you, so if any of that seems cool to you go check it out in the description but yeah see you guys next week <laughs>